Uh, I said, yeah, but what's the problem, mate? And he pulls out his night stick, whack, just hits me over the side of the head. Down I go and he puts about three or four boots into me. G'day ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Butterfield Effect. My name is Isaac Butterfield, the podcast which answers all the questions that need to be answered. Ladies and gentlemen, a great episode here. I'm sitting down with uh, someone who is extremely important in my life, the most important influential person in my life, uh, my pa, my dear daddy. Make sure you check out this podcast on the Clips channel as well. It is on YouTube, the Butterfield Effect Clips channel, and on iTunes and Spotify, leave us a rating there and subscribe so you can listen to in the car. It's audio. It's easy. Yeah. Let's get stuck into the chat that I had with the great man, the uh, the man that I'll probably look like in another 30 years. So uh, look forward to that. He's a good looking bloke. Uh, my hair's not grey yet, although I am starting to go grey, so uh, thanks, Dad. Uh, anyway, ladies and gentlemen, here's my chat with my dad. <coughs> what do you think of all this? Is this my water? That's your water. Okay. What do I think of all this? What do you think of all this? Or what? Just everything. The whole it's YouTube, the comedy, podcast. Oh, it's pretty amazing. It's... What's one way to communicate? Everybody's into it. Know your audience. If this is how you can reach your audience. But it's a weird sort of like, we've both done, and I'm obviously only just starting, but we've both done or had careers that are different. You obviously with, uh, with football and with um, Bootman, mm -hmm. movie star. What, hap what happened with Bootman? Tell me about Bootman. How did that all come about? Because you started in a movie about... I didn't star in the movie. You started... <laughs> I certainly didn't star in the movie. No, it was a... Um, actually, we were... Uh, the Knights were playing Melbourne in uh, Melbourne one night and after the game we met um, or repaired over to the, uh, the casino, as you do, and Dean Perry, the um, lead dancer and, and um, sort of man behind the tap dogs phenomenon. He was there, and he's a Newcastle bloke. Came out of uh, Gateshead, actually, and not far from us. And so he came over. He said, "I'm doing this movie. And it'd be really kitschy if we had um, you know, a couple of Newcastle sort of oh, footballers because it actually revolves a bit around the football, professional football locally." So um, he, sa he, he said to Chief and I, Paul Harrigan, um, "It'd be good to have his in." So when, when you get back to Sydney, you'll get a call from the casting people. And, you know, if you want to get involved, go along. So um, I turn up and uh, and I say to the lady, uh, I said, "So has Harrigan been here?" And, oh yeah, yeah, no, he's he's been here. He's, oh, he's 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 too sort of clean cut, and you know that the role calls for a you know a, a face a mother couldn't love. <laughs> kind of and she said, "I think you're perfect." <laughs> and um, uh, got the role and. Um, backhanded Sam Worthington, mm. try to put a little bit of my own little style in, but um, yeah, uh, uh, Adam Garcia, the other guy, Sophie Lee, local, Dudley girl, um, bit of experience and then I choreographed the uh, the football game, the league game and uh, that was it. You choreographed the league game, what do you mean? Like well, I had two credits. One as the thug, <laughs> and two as the um, as the choreo choreographer for the um, for the rugby league game. Okay, because they well, they ran in the stadium and uh, no, it was actually um, there was a game we played. Uh, it was part of the early part of the movie just to show that they played some rugby league, and it was actually over at Stockton. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we just uh, and all of these guys, most of the actors, all came from Melbourne, so no nothing about league. Used my uh, skills, knowledge of the game, so I got two credits. Nice, INDB. Yeah, and uh, which meant I got paid twice. Ah, <laughs> uh, which was good. It wasn't much, but it was uh, the officially sort of uh, union-sanctioned uh, rate for um, plebs like myself. And because all I remember from Bootman is I remember seeing that scene with you, but I also remember you wearing Bootman pajamas for two years. Well, you know, the only good thing, stick to it. <laughs> why, why do they give you pyjamas? It seems like an interesting thing to give someone after it. Uh, oh, no idea. I think it was just a little, uh, they had some merch and 
You know all about merch? I know all about merch. Check it out at the, uh, the store <laughs> below. <laughs> so let's talk footy. <clears throat> what sort of footy are we talking about? We're talking rugby league here. Okay. And you started your career at Penrith. You started uh, born mm. out of Colton. Um, yeah. I'd like to give a bit of background into your into your life before we uh, delve into the, the, the deep cabins of all the things that you've done and all the things you think. So you started playing footy. Okay, yeah. Um, I have uh, three brothers and a sister. Um, we didn't have much money. Mum and dad always looked after us. But it was always because the house was so small. You bloody kids, get out of the house, go and do something. So we were always outdoor kids. And uh, so there was none of this PlayStation or watching the newfangled television kind of thing. So it was outside and um, yeah, there were neighbours and we all played footy, rugby league, which was the game of the area. And uh, there was a bit of soccer around. I played a bit of soccer as a kid too, but, um, but we, we tended to gravitate uh, as little ferals to rugby league, it was a little bit rougher and you got to sort of run into each other. And that appealed to us as young kids. We used to do it in the hallway and it's funny when you go home now and you, you walk you walk in the hallway and you think, my God, we, you know, three of us played footy or four of us played footy on our knees in here. And uh, yeah, when it was raining or whatever, with a couple of rolled up pair of socks. And, um, and that's where we learned to really to run into each other and tackle each other and that sort of became sort of my thing. I became a quite a good defender and but, um, I plus played locally. Really had no ambitions to do anything other than football. My, my ambition, I think at the time, coming out of late school was I wanted to fly one of those F-18s. And uh, I went to the uh, careers place and um, in Sydney there and they said, oh no, no, mate, dear, um, you're too big for the cockpits. You'll have to fly the, fly the, uh, the Hercules or something. I said, no, no, I want to fly the F-18s. And, and um, when they told me I couldn't do that, sort of lost my direction a little bit. But um, uh, something had happened at school and somebody suggested I go and play with the local representative team. And that led to another number of representative teams, schoolboys. And I found myself an Australian schoolboy, which is um, sort of the highest stage you get as a rugby league player. Um, Still had no real ambitions. Went up to the local Penrith team on can of coke and a Mars bar kind of a contract. Um, but I, you know, I lived in a pretty tough area. You know, there was lots of drugs and alcohol and fights and and arrests and you know um, that created some challenges uh, for me. Or well, I guess I created those challenges for myself. Um, Any particular challenges that you faced there? Any arrests? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I remember there was, I won't use their names, but uh, uh, I was probably about 18, and I was talking to a girl, and um, I didn't know that she was with some other bloke, but I was just talking to you know, the nightclub there, the band club it's called, on the Great Western Highway. And, and um, so I came downstairs, and this one bloke, he's come over, he said, it's my girl. I said, oh, mate, I'm just talking to her, you know, like, pff, leave me alone. Anyway, he, he wants on. So he's, he's, he's a bit of a hood from over St Mary's Way. And, and, uh, and so it's on. And so now there's a mad stinking. And, and uh, this is in the car park. And I, anyway, I sort this bloke out. And, and, um, and then his mate tries it on. And so it's on, on again in the car park. So I sort this bloke out. And, and I say to uh, one of the mates, um, well, actually one of the mates yelled to me, he said, mate, we've got to get out of here, mate, the coppers will be here shortly. And okay, let's get out of here. And thankfully, you know, I came out of it without too much bark off me and I, my shirts, which, <laughs> you know, my babe shirts that you, you, you wear out because you don't want to get torn up and blood all over, was in pretty good shape. So we got away and we got around the corner and a bull wagon, the big F100s they used to have in those days, come flying around the corner. And the old collo refrain went out, bolt coppers. <laughs> and I said, I'm going nowhere, mate. These two goobers jumped me and, mate, um, you know, I'm fine. Uh, I've, I've got no issues. Uh, I'm happy to talk to the coppers. The copper pulls up, he gets out and he says, you can't. And he's growling at me. This is sort of in the dark. The headlights flashing. 
And, I, and, and as soon as he said that, I thought, what's going on here? Well, it turned out that the coppers who were coming were actually already there and these blokes were already there. And so whilst I was having this fight, apparently this bloke alleges that I've missed my target and hit the policeman. I said, anyway, I didn't know anything about that, but um, uh, I said, well, yeah, but what's the problem, mate? And he pulls out his night stick, whack, just hits me over the side of the head, down I go, and he puts about three or four boots into me and throws me in the back, and who should be in the back but the two blokes I just had the fight with. <laughs> I thought, oh, this is good. And, um, but yeah, we were a bit philosophical and we got over it. And, uh, What'd you say to him when you got in? I said, what the fuck's going on here? You dickheads and jump me and now I'm in strife and now the coppers are kicking shit out of me. And, and uh, anyway, I, I knew them from football, but they were some years older than me. Uh, so I, I didn't know them in that sense, but um, I guess when you're all in the, in the hole like that, there tends to be a camaraderie, camaraderie. <laughs> <laughs> that pulls you together. It's us against the coppers, uh, which is interesting because I, you know, apart from various other ambitions, uh, uh, a, a policeman was one sort of career path I had been thinking about. And um, uh, so that was, so we get up to the police station and an old mate says, right, you're charged with assault, assault police, or resisting arrest, like this whole slew of, you know, if anyone who's ever been there late at night after a little bit of a fracas, they can just, there's a whole list of mm. things that they, they pull <coughs> out that's like you're the worst bastard in the world. And, and uh, I'm saying, no, mate, I said, mate, these blokes, and, and, and your head sergeant just kicked the shit out of me when he picked me up and I want to press charges against him. Well, you know, I, I, I can understand coppers late at night, there's dickheads everywhere, clubs are breaking up, so they don't have a lot of patience for, for a lot of the so-called hoods that are out there and floating around and causing problems and perhaps injuring the, injuring the guys in the line of work. So, you know, I, I got that, but um, <laughs> they, st they wanted the fingerprints. And they oh, give me my bloody fingerprints, and mate. So they've grabbed the hand, and each time I did it, I just give it a little smudge right at the end, <laughs> just to smudge them all. And right, at the, right on the last one, he, um, he noted that I'd smudged the last one, then he looked at, it, looked at them all with his magnifying glass. He said, you've smudged them all. You prick, and he's hit me over the head. And, and uh, so at this point, I'm really, I'm, I'm really upset. And um, you know, tears and you pricks and, and um, realising what sort of strife I was in and uh, they ended up uh, throwing me into the cells. And so there I am lying in the cells and they're just, just a, little, a little mat on the floor and a little stainless steel toilet bowl. You really know you've hit rock bottom <laughs> when, when you go in there. And, um, and so I'm in there and, and uh, the coppers are coming in occasionally and, and I'm giving them a serve. You know, how dare you bloody do this to me? And um, uh, you, you need to be talking to your, your Crown Sergeant, he's out of control and, and um, trying to put my case, but of course they probably knew all of and that was all, that was how the coppers dealt with them in those days, you know, the kick in the ass kind of thing. But um, he did, uh, uh, within a minute or two, the, the, the sergeant came in and I was quite upset. He put his arm around me, mate, don't worry about it. Boom, <laughs> just put me onto his knee, <laughs> down like this, and into me, kicked in the head and everything. They ended up letting me out about three or four in the morning and both ears were split up here and blood everywhere. And I went to a bloke's place, took a couple of photos, you know, what do you do? Um, but the thing that really got up my nose is I ended up having to go back to court. And, and he was the, he was the, the poor old copper who'd bashed me. Oh, mate, I had to take, you know, three weeks off work because this, the, the blow, you know, gave me headaches and all the rest of it. And, and, um, and I was told by the Crown Sergeants, <coughs> don't fight it. You just have to say, yes, I'm guilty. And um, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying I'm guilty. And that, that, that happened actually a number of times in my future life, admitting to guilt when I wasn't guilty just to expedite the process. And, and to any uh, rookies out there listening, never plead guilty. Because as soon as you say guilty, they just push you aside and they decide. And that's what they did with me. And uh, I had to pay this bloke a $300 compensation or something. No, no conviction was recorded because I guess I'd um, put the pressure on these guys that uh, if they were gonna go that way, then I would then push back. But, you know, what can you do with the police? You're, 
you know, unless you've got some, some money to fight the case and lawyers and people interested in you, you, might, you just got to cop what happens. Mm. So that was, that was one of the, the fracas as a, as a young bloke. But um, anyway, we spent too much time on that, I think. <laughs> no, that's good. I mean, I, I think that obviously now, Coppers couldn't get away with that type of stuff. Everything's recorded. I mean, there's, there's security mm. cameras everywhere, my phones, all that type of stuff. Well, I actually ran into the bloke at, uh, at a helicopter rescue uh, ball recently. And he said, oh, you remember me? I went to your brother's wedding. And uh, I said, oh, yeah, so, yeah, okay, yeah. Good. And um, he says, yeah, I was, I was one of those other coppers that was there that night. And, and he's trying to sort of love up a little bit and reminisce. And, yeah. <laughs> what a great night. Yeah. And I... And I I didn't get too narky, but, I said, but he's trying to talk to me. I mate, piss off. I don't want to talk to you. I said, you, were, you, you know, what you did back then, I don't forgive that. Um, and I said, I don't know how many other people you did that to, you and your fucking dickhead copper. I know the names of them. Yeah. Put them in your book. <laughs> Why not? Anyway, let's... Alleged. Let's, let's move on. It's okay. But, 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 but it does, you grow up in an area that was pretty tough. Um, but that made you the toughest person. And you learn different you things. Be. Like you, you, when I was growing up and now, I still think of you as the toughest person I know. No, I'm not tough. I'm a pussy. <laughs> no, you fucking not. <laughs> if anyone's a pussy here, it's me. I'm the biggest took getting around. But that obviously helps you going into a football career. When you face adversity or you face challenges on and off the field, all that type of stuff for training. You move from Penrith. You, you meet someone at a train station. You come down to Newcastle uh, to start the nights. Yeah, well, that was, you know, a little bit of fate, sort of whether I believe in it or not, but it, but it does happen, you know. And, uh, and things were probably at the lowest ebb. This is probably four years after the, the copper incident. Uh, I think I threw, threw, in, threw in a DUI in between that. Nice. <laughs> Keep up appearances. God. <laughs> Um, and uh, I ran into an old schoolboys coach on the train uh, in Central Station late at night. You know, it was probably it was earlier than late, it was at three in the morning. And I said, "What are you doing here, Dave?" Just David Waite. Just coming back from Newcastle, mate. We're setting up a new club. It's going to be called the Newcastle Knights. What are you doing, Butts? I said, "Mate, I've been out all year for a groin injury, and I'm back this week." And I said, "We're actually playing your team." Canterbury and he was the coach of the Canterbury third grade team and uh, he said let's see how you go so uh, I prepared well and but you know I was trying to break out of that mold of the local area and um, you know not not to sort of impugn the quality of my mates because they're all, a lot of good blokes but a lot of blokes sort of dragging you back I guess um, uh, or, or not sort of operating to the highest standards. It's maybe they want, and, and 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 I wanted to do that. I guess I was at that age where I was ambitious and wanted to do something. And so went and played the game, played the full game. A big guy gets uh, KO Daryl Brome, and he was playing in second grade by this Jeff Robinson, who was a big monster with a black beard. And Daryl snoring as he's coming on the stretcher, and uh, the coach of the second grade said, but you're on. So that was two games in a row I'd played. And then uh, Tim Shane's played me the 20 minutes in first grade. And um, so that was my debut for the Knights, the club that I would then be part of for 13 years beyond that. But uh, that night, uh, no, the next morning at the pub, unemployed shooting pool, <laughs> as you do. Uh, trying to think, well, what's, what's my next move here? Uh, notwithstanding a good weekend at the footy. And it was a call. In those days, no mobiles and everything. The, Calls normally come to the bar and Tony Butterfield to the bar. <laughs> That's either for your um, for your Chinese dish or your um, or the phone or a girlfriend or whatever. And uh, anyway, hello, and uh, introduced himself, made an offer because I was on nothing at Penrith, and uh, and they made a reasonable offer, and that was it. Bought a combi van, multicoloured rainbow com combi van, just to fit into the vibe. Doing a bit of a Westie from Sydney and headed up the coast in November and was played there for 13 years. Had you ever been to Newcastle before that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but normally you drive around Newcastle, sort of the bypass around Newcastle. Um, and, uh, you know, you just you go past the, the cemetery on the way out of town and come over the Swansea Bridge, but that was just about the only memorable features of Newcastle. 
I've got to say, until the earthquake happened in 1989, so this was late 87, early 88, the first year of the night, <clears throat> Christmas 89, there was an earthquake. And because a lot of the old construction and there'd been nothing done for a long time and the old brickwork and whatnot, a lot of the places caved in. You know, where, where once there was 30 pubs along Hunter Street alone on every corner and a, and a vibrant pub scene and bands and everyone's out on the, on the uh, footpaths just enjoying life and because it was a uni town or it is a uni town. And, uh, but once the, uh, the earthquake happened, um, a lot of stuff got knocked down and a lot of rebuilding and that sort of stimulated the area a little bit and um, some more developments. It took many years to get to the point it is now where things have really taken off in this construction boom. But um, yeah, no, it was, a, mate, it, was a, it was a good town. And it was a town that, um, you know, it was all, everyone was a tradie, worked in the coal mines, worked over at BHP, like in those days, BHP at its, at its peak had eight or 9,000 employees. And then you've got thousands of employees in the factories around it that were making components and all the rest of it. Uh, so it was, it was a, you know, uh, as, as clear as you can get, a working class town. And uh, I liked that style. Um, you know, there was no, um, no flies on these guys. They were hard working and, uh, you know, you, you couldn't sort of joke your way out of circumstances. They were um, good, honest folk. And, and uh, uh, that meant that uh, sort of the style of football that we played because Newcastle had, had a long history with the game. And, so they'd be watching very carefully, looking for you know, honesty and courage and some of the real basic tenets of, 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 um, of how, how you play the game well. And uh, I did that along with you know, many other players in the early days. And we won, won the, uh, the interest of the community and, and um, gradually included some, some great stars like the Andrew Johns, Matthew, the Robbie O'Davis, the Gidley boys. Um, Owen Craigies, you know, there was a whole host of young, talented boys, most of them from the local area. So, uh, you know, that, um, that all good well for the, the local support, you know, local players, local support. You know, we can do it here in Newcastle. We don't have to go outside. Newcastle, I think, always had a little bit of a chip on their shoulder, a little bit of an inferiority complex with, uh, in relation to Big Brother down in Sydney. Uh, well learned, I think. Um, because it's been a safe labour seat for a hundred odd years kind of thing. Nobody's ever wanted to spend any money here. It's basically just an industrial town and we'll keep the ports open to keep the country fanging in terms of in imports, exports. But other, other than that, um, you know, we won't put anything into the town, but Newcastle has really come into its own in more recent times with uh, uh, various events, you know, the car racing and mm. you know, it's got gorgeous beaches. It's, I, uh, I met a gorgeous local girl who turned out to be your mother. And um, hey, yeah, and um, uh, five boys later, and here we are. What, what do you think changed? Uh, you, you talk about the town really investing in the club of the Knights. What, what, what changed that? What made that? What was the catalyst for, for, the, for, for the town looking at the Knights as a part of the community? I remember seeing as a kid when I used to go into the sheds. Because it was a big part of my life was, was watching you play. And I mean, not, not that much that I can remember, but I can remember going into the sheds and all that type of stuff. And even after you retired, we go in there and there's always that frame on the wall. Um, I think it was as you walk out. From the earthquake. From the earthquake. Mm. Can you, I, I don't know if, if we can find, hopefully we can find one kind of a photo of that, but there's, a, there's a, a, a photo of a hand going into the rubble, grabbing another hand. And this hand has the Knights jersey on and this hand has like some tattered clothes. Yeah, it was symbolic of the Knights will help Newcastle pull itself out of the, from out of the rubble. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we would give it a little touch. Like it was, it was, uh, uh, you know, it, it was such a harrowing experience. So you touch it as you walk out, that's what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, in fact, um, I was, uh, you know, for those who've never been in an earthquake or felt an earthquake, it's quite um, surreal. You, um, myself and uh, Blake Troy Clark, we were, up on the hill overlooking BHP at Waratah. And um, we were doing bench press and whatnot. We had the music pumped and it was in a big shed out the back and uh, as you do. And, and so I, uh, so um, uh, Troy was on the, the bench press 
And just as he went to press a big weight, and I was a spotter, <laughs> then the earthquake starts and everything looks like it's turned to jelly. The concrete looks like it's turned to jelly. And it's, it's obviously just your, your eyes not being able to pick up the, the change in the move. But everything was going everywhere and, and, I, and the, the stereo fell over and I've fallen over. I'm on the floor. The weights have gone here, bang, bang, bang. Then we hear boom and we look out over the hill over the big BHP steelworks and there's massive fire roaring up. So one of the big uh, blast furnace had shifted and, and there was flames everywhere. And I thought, oh my God, I'm like, is it BHP's blown up? Is that what, what's just happened? And, and the mate at the time, Troy, he had uh, one of those cars that looks like he's uh, you know, a bit of an emergency, you know, he's got a little bit of a yeah, yeah. siren on the top kind of thing. And he said, uh, and cause they, they'd very quickly shut off town and, were, and uh, various things had happened in, in Hamilton. Some had happened in, uh, in, in town with the workers club it collapsed and you know, killed many people and a lot of people trapped. And, so uh, Troy and I sort of head into town and the police were stopping us and mate, where were the emergency services? <laughs> Through you go. So we started pulling rubble out and until, you know, the um, the call went out that, uh, because around those times, you know, you you wonder what you need to do. Like if if you were down there under the hole, I would keep going, despite the fact, oh mate, coming around, everyone out, everyone move back. There's gonna be aftershocks. Yeah. We've got to clear the area. And I'd be saying, well, I'm not, mate. I've got to go and get Isaac. You know, he might be on death's door. And on, on, the, on the hope that there's going to be, or on the prediction, there's going to be another afterquake. Uh, and there wasn't. Uh, not nothing, uh, not anything uh, significant. But that was um, uh, fairly harrowing. So, yeah, we, uh, we took that to heart that uh, yeah, so many people in Newcastle, because of the old, a lot of the old properties, just about everybody was affected. You know, even just something as simple as just moving it, the house off the, off the supports kind of thing and cracks everywhere. And I had a mate who came up here a month uh, or a year earlier as a bricklayer, but he was one of those older bricklayers where they did a lot of tuck pointing and a lot of the old, the old uh, skills that aren't now part of the bricklayer's uh, trade. And because Newcastle had all of that old architecture, his work just went through the roof mm. for years. It was making us killing, repairing all of these old houses. So we would touch these things and it was quite uh, reverent for us for, uh, well, it still is, people still touch it. Um, but we were part of the community. A lot of the guys came from the community. Um, and as I say, that there was 100 years of rugby league in the community. Uh, the, the, the Newcastle actually had left the professional competition in 1910. Um, only a bit of a blow up with uh, the Sydney guys and they said, well, uh, they were known as the Rebels and they moved back to Newcastle and they set up their own comp. So that's where these other teams, Central and Curry and Cessnock and whatnot, um, hail from. Uh, and so for many years, the culture was quite insular. We played footy up here, the grand finals attracted 20, 30,000 people and the Sydney stuff was occasionally on the television. Um, but it was, a, it was a local game and, and it did some, some amazing things. And uh, so there was, there was a bit of pushback because that strong local comp, which had been there for a long time, which had spawned Lee's clubs, which were quite you know, impressive concerns. Um, uh, they were still playing their comp, but we had rode into <coughs> town um, in a sense to usurp the top level of rugby league here and become the top level and these guys would then be sort of forced back and that was that went over like a lead balloon with those very close to those clubs so there was a little bit of anxiety so you had a lot of yeah you, know, you had some opposition other people were quite uh, open to the to the prospect um, so we definitely had to prove ourselves that okay if you're going to come up here and cause all this drama and and uh, turn the place on its head over after you know scores of years you better be bloody good. Uh, and we were hopeless early on. But what we were good at was tackling. <laughs> Blokes who, who were tough could tackle and had plenty of tomorrows. That was the criteria uh, to get into the team in those early days. Um, so whilst we couldn't score many tries, our, our ambition every week stated eventually after we understood the stats, after we found out that um, the amount of teams that lost after they played us 
and we, we'd like to attribute that to the fact that uh, we just belted them up that much that they within a week you know they got beaten by the next team because we'd softened them up so that was our that was our thing and the Newcastle crowds love that you know of course they love to see flashy stuff um, but short of that um, let's see your belting blokes and let's see your determination in defence when you know all is lost and you you don't give up and you push forward and and um, and, and that's the basis of any you know good sporting team or any military outfit you've got to, your defence has got to be mm. you know, better than any, anything and um, and so that was a good place to start for us. Was that something you enjoyed flying? Like I, I know for me personally, when I was playing. Trying to fly out of the line and trying to hurt someone was my favourite part of playing. Yeah. It was for you as well? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you had to have different things. Yeah, one bloke, had, he had a, a turn of pace and a left foot step. <coughs> yeah, okay, that's, that's his thing. You know, other blokes had a beautiful pass or you could do other things. My thing was, <laughs> it's funny, in the first year of the Knights, uh, Alan McMahon and Alan Bell, uh, the early coaches, had d different views on um, different roles within the team, like little squads within the team had different responsibilities. And so, um, you know, one guy was the, the captain of the kick chase, so the ball would get kicked and, it, and he'd, he'd lead everyone down and he'd be hunting everybody up and, and whatnot. Um, captain of the speed of the line, moving up and defending. And I, I got captain of enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, you sure? Maybe we can work on that title. But, but it, it, it actually struck me later that it's a crucial part of playing. You've got to be up. You've got to be keen. You've got to be enjoying what you're doing. And that can become infectious because a lot, of, a lot of people can tend to end up in little islands when pressure's on and the team could just lose that cohesiveness a little bit. And, and, um, uh, and part of doing that, one of the, the ways that I could do that was to fly out of the line and belt blokes. And so that became my thing. And uh, it's actually very dangerous. Mm. You know, you've got 100 kilo blokes and I'll sprint off the line. I might get up to 30 kilos uh, kilometers an hour. The bloke's running back at me at 30 and he's 110 kilos. And, but it was all about timing and where you, where you made the tackle um, there's, yeah, there's a little bit of science to it. It's not just two bikes colliding because both of you end up, if you get it wrong. Um, whereas when you got it perfectly right, you could just fly up and this bloke could go like that and you would hardly feel it mm. because of the, your timing. And, and you just got better at that over, over time. Actually, the reason I got became quite good at that was because um, back in the the days when me and the brothers would just play in the backyard or down the park, all the other kids would go home, we'd run out of kids to play with, so we'd just line up and run at each other as hard as we can. And we'd just be snotting each other <laughs> and thinking, how good's that good tackle? And I'd get the other little brother, he'd be eight years old, right, I'm gonna run at you, mate, and you've gotta hit me like this. And, and, uh, and then we'd swap roles and, 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 and Grant became, the younger brother, he became a, an excellent front on tackler, I think as a result of that. So that was my thing, yes. Yeah, but um, uh, yeah, it's all all interesting. But I I I think about it now with the um, you know, with the spectre of concussion and and those sorts of issues that um, we don't know enough about. Mm. You know, with all of our young uh, athletes who who collide with other athletes. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's a, there's an element that uh, you know the body's sufficiently malleable enough to to repair itself for what would be considered normal collisions. Uh, but when you turn it into a sport and you do it every day and every week, that's, I, I don't think the, uh, the, our great creator, you know, had uh, set our brains up for that. But, well, uh, I think that's the problem, isn't it? It's a continuous, and people talk about the sub-concussive uh, injuries where it's the constant, like from a hit up or from if you're boxing, you're taking a jab or from sparring or whatever. Mm. That constant, even the small one, like people are getting a, this CTE, chronic tra traumatic encephalopathy, from things like um, uh, what's it called when you're on the bloody ski doos on the fuck, what's it called? On the luges or whatever. No, 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 I'm talking about on the water. Oh, yeah, jet, uh, jet skis. Yeah, people are getting like a CTE from 
from jet skis and from getting brain uh, brain trauma or brain problems or black spots on the brain from heading soccer balls, all mm. those different types of things. Yeah, I could, I could, I could imagine. I, you, you look at the, you know, it's, it's a little bit like climate change, this debate, and that, you know, we don't quite have enough information to be emphatic about this, but, you know, does it, if it waddles and quacks like a duck, am I going to call it a duck? Um, uh, or do you just err on the side of caution? Um, uh, and I think, of course, you know, the latter. Let's um, let's take yeah, change the rules of the game, perhaps that that reduces the the closing speeds. Perhaps. Can you reduce that with things like well, contact sports? Well, it, it depends how sensitive each individual is to a knock. You could, you know, you run into some old blokes who played. You know, and they're in their seventies and eighties, and they converse clear as a bell, no problem. Um, and yet, as you say, you can run into some other people who've taken a knock or two, mm. and you know they've got they're punch drunk. Punch drunk. Yeah, that's um, so. I, I, some of the research I've looked at, um, you know, there's some suggestion it's a, and not unsurprisingly, it's a. It could be a. Um, you know, a, a genetic predisposition or something that you, you know, that um, one person will feel the knocks more than others and they can deal with it. And, uh, either way, it's, you know, it's, it's quite unknown, it's quite scary. And, and um, uh, so what do we do about it? You know, it's, I look at the junior football, uh, whilst, I, you know, a bit like the climate change issues or various other issues that are important for a moment and then as we get back into life, they're not so important. Um, you know, you see young kids get knocked out or knocked quite severely at junior football. And so if it's over the other side of the field and it's 60, 70 metres away and nobody quite saw from the bench what happened. Well, little Billy's down, run out and see what happened. Oh, he hit his head. Is he all right? He says he's all right. Can't tell. Mm. You know, a lot of coaches play on. You know, let's go. If it happens right in front of you, <coughs> and little Billy gets knocked, and you see that boom, and you hear the hit, and you go, oh, geez, well you know. And and a smart coach just say, well, listen, Billy, and listen, Dad, who's who wants him to go back out there? No, he's not playing today, and he, and in my view, shouldn't have, shouldn't play next week mm. after any episode, uh, particularly kids. Um, but not just kids, and uh, so it's a, it's an imprecise science. It's enforced uh, sporadically, um, with no real backbone. It's more just uh, the quality of the coaches and their first aid, and I guess you know they're doing what they can. But um, there aren't a lot of tools out there, even at the first grade level. That you know somebody can be um, you know in Disneyland snoring one week, and um, you know he, he gets tested in whatever protocol that's available. You know, you stand on one leg and recite uh, the alphabet backwards or tell the examiner where you are and where you were and, and how do you feel. And, mm. and then you, and it's just a sub subjective view. M maybe there's a, there's a scoring arrangement, but. Yeah, I don't know how it works, but I've seen people, particularly in the NRL, take a big shot. You know, they're, as you said, in Disneyland, they're wobbling off the field, they had to get carried off or whatever happens. And then they go and do this uh, concussion test, and they're back on the field. It's, it just seems like there's got to be, for me, looking in, not knowing any of the the medical side of things. Surely this person suffered an injury there. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, absolutely. And it's 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 more so, more obvious to, from from those or by those who have who have been there. Mm. You know, if I watch a hit. I was once criticised by a particular guy who's now the head of the medical for the rugby union world cup uh and um lance thompson lance thompson lance yeah the footballer no um lance yeah lance lance thompson yeah anyway, he uh he's in a game and he gets knocked out once twice three four times those days you don't go off and uh, and i'd made a comment to the nrl a couple of days later that um, this bloke was, uh, oh, this is out of control. This was early 2000s. And, and I got a, a very terse legal letter through the NRL, forwarded back onto me from this particular guy that, you know, how would you know? You're not a medical practitioner.
practitioner and you wouldn't know and um, whether this bloke was concussed or not. And, and, um, uh, and if you don't retract that, mate, you know, I'll see you. And I rang him up, I said, mate, you dickhead. I said, he was either drunk or he was concussed. So people don't stagger. No. They, don't, they don't have to be held up by the trainers. I said, you just didn't want to take him off because the coach didn't want you to take him off because he's one of the better players. And, and this, this is the problem you've got. Everybody wants to win professional games. That's the objective. And you'll do a lot of things and you'll people, a lot of people get hurt in the, in the pursuit of victory. Um, but at what point do you have a duty of care? Uh, is, is probably the thing for him, definitely the thing for me. Um, anyway, that was just one case and it was many years ago. But um, in fact, uh, you know, the NRL talk of, you know, we've only just you know, discovered that there's some issues here and, and you really can only, uh, we can only recognise any sort of um, research into that sort of back to about 212. So anything before that, we're not, you know, it's nothing to do with us. Um, and I, I remembered, uh, well, in my last year in 2000, I got, um, I got cited because I'd knocked this fellow out. Martin Lang was his name. Now, Martin, uh, I knocked him out about five minutes into the second half. But the start of the first half, we kicked off. A big crowd at Marathon Stadium, everybody's cheering, and we fly down, and this, and I give it to Martin Lang. Now, Martin is a great bloke, tough crocodile, and just run straight. So everybody's making a beeline for him. <laughs> yeah, all the gunslingers, there. Uh, this, this is a nice way to open up. Let's sit this bloke on his ass. And um, he's, uh, he just swerved a little bit. And this Danny Smiles, who was, who was just sort of coming, coming into professional um, <coughs> sport, um, wanted to make an impression. So, so he's sort of a little bit off line and he's collected him at you know 60 kilometers closing pace hitting with his forearm in the jaw boom, martin's down it was one of the worst ones i've ever seen and um then he ended up copying i think you know, eight weeks ten weeks or something as a suspension at the judiciary uh, a few days later but um anyway martin goes off uh on a stretcher and he's in a bad way and you know i, I, I remember going over and just sort of wrestling his head and yeah, take it easy, big fella. And you know, we, the old front rowers, we all have a little bit of a code between each other. We don't like to see each other get damaged too much, unless it's by each other. Yeah. <laughs> kind of thing. So he goes off. Start of the second half. We're out there because we got out there early. They were a bit slow coming out of the sheds. And here's Martin striding out. Like, and I'd, so I said to the ref at the time, I said, This is ridiculous, sir. I said, He shouldn't be out here. And um, yeah, you know, I was the captain at the time, so I had a little spruik, and I had different views on just how hard the game was getting, and and um, uh, how, how we were being treated by the clubs, you know, with injuries and particularly concussions and whatnot, which really wasn't stoked, spoken about too much. Anyway, five minutes in, he, a bit of an awkward tackle. I sort of got around behind him, and I tried to just sort of get him from the behind, and I just happened to clip his chin, which is sort of you know, that point at which it sends your balance out and all. Um, and he just collapsed in, collapsed in my arms. And I just, and he's down. And the ref said, mate, mate, you clipped him there. I said, mate, I hardly hit him. I said, he shouldn't even be out here. Uh, anyway, he's off snoring again. Like, this is crazy. Um, so I go down to judiciary and, and luckily my brother, uh, John, who had a, um, uh, he was doing a sports science degree at the time, he, he found a paper which I adduced as evidence uh, at my hearing to defend my case, and it was a British medical journal, sort of a longitudinal study in rugby league, the only one and first one of its kind in the concussion and the impact of the, the second syndrome, concussion, sort of the time after. And, and that's, that was basically the, the outcome, you know. The time after is the secret. With different people, it takes different time uh, to, for the brain to recover and reach that whatever a point that um, uh, you're not doing further damage. And, uh, uh, and so my evidence was simply that the, the club had put everybody in harm's way, putting this Martin Lang out there, including Mark, including um, Martin, including me and everybody else. 
and it was an absolute disgrace that they'd sent him back out there. And, and so I got off, which was great because it was only a couple of games before the end of my career. Otherwise, I could have spent that on the sideline. But, but that gave me some real interest. And, and, and to this day, uh, speaking to the, uh, the guy who was prosecuting against me working for the NRL that night, he's a lawyer, and um, uh, you know he, um, he was involved with the men of league. And, um, you know, he, he confirms that, that that information was was present. I said, what happened to it? That was a fairly significant paper. Did that get passed up? Did that get then understood, consumed by the powers that be and maybe, you know, sort of appreciated for the for the worth it could provide to the understanding of these sorts of knocks? And he said, oh, important papers like that, and that one did go up to the NRL. So um, for, any, for any argument by the NRL that they knew nothing about all of this sort of stuff, like... Uh, surely they either knew from there was an example there with me, uh, or if they're being proactive, they should have been doing their own study because this is this is a game that obviously knocks people out. Scrums come in like this, boom, boom, boom. You talk about your subconcussive sort of shots where you just do a you know, pack down thirty scrums a game, um, and you might have to pack down two or three before it's decided. Uh, so the amount of knocks that you'll take there, but. Uh, the concussion is a is a is a big, big problem. I don't know what the game's going to look like in twenty years' time. I think it'll be determined basically by the availability of insurance. Mm. You know, if you can't get insurance, if, if you can't be insured, uh, then you can't play the game. So there'll be a changing of the guard. I, I don't know. Um, you know, there's a lot of money at stake, so everyone's pushing forward. And uh, but they're, um, you know, to what extent are they destroying lives or? Um, uh, it, it worries me. It worried me when you were playing. It worried me when all the boys were playing. I don't particularly uh, support kids playing too young. Mm. But anyway, that's a that's that's a serious part well, of the game. It is, and it's one of those things where you, you say, you know, the kids should have a week off. In boxing, you get knocked out. In the UFC, MMA, you get knocked out. You're off for six months. Yeah, yeah, no. It's I, it, it amazes me that we we could settle on a week. It's where does that you know where does that number come from? Why is it a week? You know. It's well, because these these things aren't decided on sort of medical evidence. Um, these things are decided on on what people are prepared to compromise on and yeah. on the health of the of, of the people who work for them, um, uh, <coughs> and you know the people involved in the decision making on in, in, in that that sense. You know, was this decision or that decision of one week or whatever um, decided on by the doctors? Club doctors who, you know, have their uh, their oath and and probably would prefer much longer. Or was there an involvement by the coaches? Just oh no no no, and the, and the club CEOs. Hmm. So well, no, we don't want a mandatory two weeks because that's going to come back and bite us on the ass when we go into the the big game of the year and we have to have a mandatory stand down for a guy who otherwise looks fine. Um, so it doesn't fit every case, and and so they made some arguments, and and so long as you can stand on one foot and and recite um, a few formulas, uh, you're good to go. That clears, perhaps absolves the club that they've done all, all they can based on the current uh, information. But there is, there's, new info, there's new sort of techniques coming out now, but I was approached by a guy recently, eye guide, I think they were called. They basically look at the retina of the eye and, and basically there's a sort of a, a certain set of marker points within the eye that get measured when you're in your best calm, circumstance so they get a datum point based on when it's most in symmetry if you like um, and then if you take a knock they can then look at it the same way and have 140 different data points and you might see it all skewed outside sort of uh, wh where they should be these data points and um, uh, then again you know whilst that's a little bit objective um, uh, a little bit subjective it's, it's it still gives some you know s some um, some rigour to the decision to make a, to allow a guy to play. Um, so um, because at the moment, as I say, it's just too uh, you know it's it's too subjective, too too open to manipulation. And also, you know, players like if you ask a player, listen, mate, you've just taken a knock, and you, although you feel pretty good, mm. our evidence tells us that there's some residual sort of problem there. And mate, we're going to hold you out for the next two weeks. Well, mate, that's the grand final. Yeah, I've been playing for twenty years. That's my holy grail. And you're going to keep me out because 
you know, just for caution. So it's not just the system and the players, or the coaches and that, that, that are a challenge in this process because players are, by their nature, you know, tough bastards and, and want to play and they're hungry. And uh, uh, not to mention, you know, success in big games can improve your professional commercial outcomes. Mm. Um, so, uh, well, it's given me it's given me sort of a mindset when when I eventually have kids. Like, do I want them playing footy? Do I want them doing something more, hmm. um, more relaxed, like a bit of jujitsu or some soccer or whatever? Like, it's 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 a concern. It's a fear, you know, to see see a young fellow or a young girl go out there and, and get hurt. Yeah, it, it it is, but at the same time, you know, we've got five boys, so there's a, there's a sense that you want your boys to be. A, you know, be able to rough and tumble and mix it and at least get that sort of physical prowess where they're, you know, it helps them socially perhaps, helps them with their confidence, helps them, you know, you know, there's, there's some bad buggers out there when you're, when you're traveling in the evenings and, and to be able to feel cool and comfortable in yourself that, you know, you can handle most situations. And a lot of that can come from exposure to, you know, going down the PCYC with the police boys and a bit of boxing or playing a bit of rugby league or playing any team sport, really. Yeah. Um, but I, I think there'll be a changing of the guard uh, over the next uh, few years uh, as, as more evidence comes down and, and the, the case becomes a lot more clearer. But, uh, but at the moment, um, but I've, you know, I've, I've seen a lot of good footballers and they're struggling. Uh, with life off the field. Yeah, my age, uh, older, younger, uh, and to what extent, um, you know, the sort of what's happened back then, it's, it's hard to make a connection mm. uh, because there's a, a lot of sort of alcohol involved, perhaps in the, in the <coughs> football culture. Um, what role does alcohol play in exacerbating any sort of potential problems there? So, you know, let's not put the blame entirely on this. So there's a, I think there's a, a lot of factors that confound each other and, and you know, as humans, we all try and settle on, you know, do this and you'll get that outcome and it's nice and simple. But I don't think it's that simple. I think there's a lot going on with uh, ex-players, you know, we saw in the, you know, the US with the concussion movie with Willie Smith and, and uh, you know, I've seen a lot of it over here. It's just sort of anecdotal. There's really nowhere to go. Uh, there was... Uh, there's some talk by uh, one guy who was involved with the men of league here that uh, they did a pilot study and discovered um, that there was uh, a whole flotilla of footballers uh, who were suffering from mental, mental illness. Um, and they selected, uh, he told me, from the, from the 60s, the grand final winning teams. It's more, more a pilot study, put that to the NRL. And um, the NRL had... Um, uh, you know, decide whether they should invest based on the quality of the data that comes through, whether they can help them out. And uh, uh, he came back, he said, oh, mate, it was just riddled through these teams. Uh, one he found, which was interesting, uh, I think it was, it was Canterbury, the Canterbury team, he said there was a whole cluster of cancer. Uh, and further research, he found that um, that the, the, the Belmore Sports Ground, and I don't know this is fact or whatever, this is, this is a, a guy who's a lawyer, uh, who's not prone to bullshit. Um, he, he tells me that it was it used to be an old tip, an old rubbish dump, and then they covered it over. So um, anyway, they, they, they eventually put that pilot, pilot study through to the NRL. Again, I don't know whether this is exactly true. Um, and he tells me, and then the NRL said, mate, pff, they said, we can't release this, we can't follow this, this through, this, is, um, this will shut the game down tomorrow quote unquote, um, so bury it. Yeah. Now, like I say, it's, it's, it's quite a statement to make uh, and I don't make it lightly, but if it were close to true, and this bloke's, like I say, he's not prone to hyperbole, he's, uh, uh, and he then resigned from his role with the men of league um, after having helped help set it up. So he was a bloke pretty pissed off that that the men of league was actually set up to look after ex-footballers. And so it was logical that they could provide some evidence based on the results of any damage and then provide that back to the NRL to assist them with their strategies to ameliorate 
what they then have to deal with in the afterlife. Um, but uh, it uh, never got a hearing, apparently. So, so you've got these apocryphal little yarns sort of spinning in the background. Is this true? Surely they wouldn't be that callous. <clears throat> but you know, it's a billion dollar business. You've got a lot of people employed and there's a, there's a, lot, of, uh, there's a lot at stake. Um, so you'd like to get to the bottom of that, but uh, whether you do or you don't, uh, a lot of these blokes are quite coy on sort of saying anything publicly, but um, yeah, that's, uh, mate, that's, that's a concussion world and um, to the extent I understand it. And, and uh, I think we should all be uh, very vigilant mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, for kids particularly, you know, for you know, parents out there, mate, give your kid a week off. If he takes him, not give him a week off. You know, give him two weeks off. It like, just it makes sense, doesn't it? It's like well, know. it makes a lot of sense. Except there's not every parent sensible. Not every parent is in it. You know, I'm not saying I'm a great parent or, or whatever, but you know, for me and for just about every parent you can talk to, it's about their care and their their, their health and all the rest of it. But there are some um, and some coaches probably who who don't fully understand the circumstance that they all um uh, oh no he'll be right my boy's right he's tough mm. he'll be right like oh, mate, I'll talk to him at home he's fine he's fine no no pick him pick him next week you've got a lot of parents sort of, you know like soccer mums and you know, soccer dads or what footy mums and dads and uh, so that puts a lot of pressure on coaches it also gives coach a bit of an out mm. you know I probably don't want him to play but um, or I, I do want him to play but his parents happy so if his parents happy and I'll play him because he's a gun player we can't win without this bloke uh, so to what extent do you cut the throat of the chances of your football team because your gun player took a knock last week and by rights you really shouldn't have him back, just erring on the side of caution at the very least. So they're dilemmas, but, but in, the, in, the, in the junior level, very hard to police. So it comes down to the quality of the, the, uh, um, well, the appetite of the, the local committees and all the rest of the volunteers. And these guys are, you know, are volunteers. And, and there could be some sort of, you know, quite strong personalities amongst coaches. So it's a, it's an ongoing battle to keep uh, keep an eye on our kids. Well, you are a good parent. I yeah. just like to point that out. Thank you. You never sort of pressured me into playing footy or anything like that. It was sort of just uh, yeah. the thing that I wanted to do. Like I always wanted to play for the Knights. That was my big thing. And then around maybe 12, 13, I sort of realised that that wasn't a possibility. And why? I just wasn't very good. So I, I thought that maybe I would I'd follow another sort of path. Do you ever remember me suggesting that I wanted to do stand-up? Yeah. Like when? Oh, mate, it's probably 17. Yeah. Mm. And then what, what were your thoughts when, like, you know, if I'm not out there following a, a normal career, what are, what are your thoughts as a parent? Is oh, that, is mate, that... mate I, I, I've been pretty relaxed about, uh, as my parents were, you know, this, this sort of, like, what is a normal career? Hmm. You know, what's, what's normal? You know, what's, what's normal and, and, or what's best? What's best for our child? You know, and, 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 and by and large, your child will decide what's, what is best for them if, if you give them enough support and a little bit of guidance and, and occasionally a little bit of a shove in the right direction. And, um, um, but you can't make, you know, we want our kids to be, strong and independent and, and uh, prepared to make their own call. So in order, in order to build all of those things, you need, you need to have made bad calls mm. um, to improve your decision-making process. And, um, you know, a dog who you know, runs out under, under cars chasing wheels and that, you know, once he gets his foot run over, he won't do that again. So that needs to, that needs to happen. So you got to make errors and you were making a few errors and, your brothers are making errors, and but they're getting smarter. From oh, I think mistakes are the best thing you can learn. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, the, they're, they're the best thing that can happen as a young person is to to fuck up in, in several situations and then go, okay, well this is the way I'm going to go, or well, this is all, you know, you you make so many mistakes and then eventually something works and you go, okay, cool, that's how this sort of works. You know, you you throw as much as you can at one thing or several things and then something mm. sticks and then you run with it. And that's, so so long as you're throwing yourself at something. 
you know, that's that word earlier I used, enthusiasm. You know, it, it sounds just like a word, you know, as, uh, an adjective that um, people can talk about, but it, but it is crucial that, you know, unless you have that, that inner spark, that energy to, to, to do something, to try something, to be something, to, to break outside the square, to, to uh, change how things are done. This is, because uh, everything can be done better or improved. Uh, and mo most things, you know, just there's a little tweak here and there. Uh, I remember um, the thing that changed my, my way of thinking, you know, because I just grew up in a normal family. We had a lot of confidence, you know, mum and dad would always, you know, the Butterfield boys could do anything. And you know, whether we believed that, um, you know, I think to a large extent we did. You know, nobody told us we couldn't, and every time we tried hard at something, we'd achieve well. And uh, I got in a stri got in strife during that period uh, that I was at Penrith, and uh, uh, I was playing first grade the next week. But um, so Tim Shearing, the coach, he said, "No, so I don't want you to go into the club um, uh, because I'd got in a fight a couple of weeks earlier. And you know, if you get barred from the club, well, that that's that's a part of the contract. You can't be barred from the club." And, well, uh, good at. Uh, anyway, we had a couple of beers with the Colleton boys one day and they said, oh, we've got to go up to the club and there's, there's a band on and I think it was uh, radiators or something. And, and oh, we've got to go up there. Oh, I can't go up. Oh, mate, we'll, we'll put a hat on you and glasses. <laughs> and we're lip sip sucking in, the, in his backyard and that gave us enough, enough courage. We got up there, I got kicked out. And so I get to training the, the next uh, week and um, Tim Shane's called me in. He said, mate, you're in first grade this week. You're going to make your first grade debut. He said, unfortunately, I told you not to go in there. And mate, I am disappointed. And uh, he said, so we've cut you back to number 55. You're sitting on the bench for the next two weeks of third grade. And I want you out of the game. I don't want you in the game. You're not prepared to put, put an effort in. And there was a guy, Davey Bolton. He, he, um, Dave was a, uh, a phenomenal English 5'8". He toured out here a few times and, and eventually stayed out here and he was one of Tim's right-hand man and he said, but luckily Dave's got a bit of time for you. So Dave's going to keep an eye on you. I've had a gut full of you. And, um, and if you want to stay, he said, there's a couple of provisos. You can't have a beer in the state of New South Wales for the next 12 months in, in a pub. Yeah. And secondly, um, apart from being dropped, uh, I need you, I want you, you must undertake this particular Dynamics of Personal Motivation course by a bloke named Paul Meyer. And it was all, all a kit and it had tapes and you listen to the tapes and you go through the networks and, and you've done it. Not part of it. And Jonas is doing it at the moment. But um, it changed the way I thought because um, I think, you know, we don't learn a lot of things at school. We learn what they want us to be, you know, good units of production and and whatnot, but a lot of those inner things that we need to understand, the teachers aren't equipped to teach, you know, about self-motivation, understanding the role of um, conditioning in life. You know, you, you get sort of slapped down or you get told for many years that you can't do this or you're useless or be careful and all this. And, you know, a lot of kids are getting sort of feeling that with um, helicopter parents and, and so they don't build up that, that resilience. and and appreciation for themselves and they're sort of limited by that conditioning and and so we are a conditioned people and once you sort of understand that a little bit you go okay well so whatever I think doesn't necessarily is not necessarily the case um, and so this this course would talk about you know, the abundance of uh, things out there and your opportunity to go out there and get them you can get anything you want you can do anything you want uh, but the secret was to align them with your values so you know um, and the important values in life that um, you, know, you wanted to be known as an honest man, a, a good man, a, a faithful man, a, a man that could support and help. And you know, is, is that what you want to be? If you want to make, if, if that's what you want to be, then the goals need to align with that. And if they align with those values, then you're more likely to uh, achieve them, particularly if you do all the planning that was part of the course. You know, you'd, you'd write down the, the various dates and the steps in the process. And, and so, so goal setting itself is um, a bit like financial management. It's just not taught in school, yet is crucial, absolutely crucial to the development and the, and the, the potential of, of all young people. Um, 
because if you don't understand the mechanism that can get you out of a problem or take it to another level, and you don't know how to engineer it and get it there, uh, which is basically goal setting and self-motivation and, and having a strong value system that, that drives you and pushes you on and is natural for you, then you, know, you can sort of just keep missing targets all the time and get frustrated and lose confidence. And, Anyway, so that was, uh, I had to do that course and uh, uh, there a lot of other good players over there at the time, but it cost, it cost my entire contract. So I was on say two grand plus a couple of game payments. This cost 2,600, this was in 1987. Um, <laughs> 2,600, oh, God, this bloke was making a killing. And, um, but it was probably the best thing I'd ever done because it was, you know, I, I don't normally go in for those self-help books and I, you know, Anthony Robbins and all this. But, um, but I guess there are times in your life where you are looking for something and you're trying to work things out and how, how do I move to the next level? And for me, that was, a, that was good timing and um, changed the way I thought about everything. And to this day, I believe, you know, mate, world's your oyster. Mm. Uh, that was, there were um, uh, comments in there about, um, you know, the world of abundance. Is, is, is there a world of abundance out there? Do you see the glass half full kind of thing? And it was, um, you know, did um, did Rembrandt, you know, bemoan the fact there were, you know, only two or three. Well, how many, how many primary colours are there? Three. Jeez, I don't know. <laughs> Google that. <laughs> three, three, three. Did he did he have a problem with that? No, he mixed them up. You know, did um, did uh, Shakespeare have a problem that was only you know five vowels and twenty six letters? Yeah. Um, did um, Beethoven? You know, have a problem that was only eight notes in the octave. You know, no, no, no. They, they, they went outside that and they created other things and they weren't limited. And, and and I think if you can start thinking that way, that there is a you know there's a rational process. Okay, it's a planning process. You work through it. You set your goal. It's aligned with your with your value system. Um, in order, if you set the goal right, you do all the planning. You actually foresee all the hurdles that you're going to run into. <clears throat> and you map those out and then you come up with a strategy, okay, when I, when I reach this hurdle, how do I get over this? Okay, all right. And then set a date on it. I used to have them on my wall at home, mum and dad, and, um, and you'd see a box not ticked. So it's in a linear, you'd set it out in a linear sort of fashion. And this box hasn't been ticked for weeks. And so you're doing, it just drives you mm. to tick that box and achieve that step in the, in the, in the goal. Right, boom, finally it's ticked. Yes, right now I'll move to the next one. And that's where my focus is. And so I'd, 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 I'd um, like to see a lot of kids um, you know, be exposed more so to, to some of these survival skills. Like I, I mentioned financial management. You know, you know, the language of the world used to be love and now it's, it's money. Uh, everybody wants your gold and, and, and they'll do anything to get it. We saw that in the Royal Commission, in the banks and, and the like. Uh, just highway robbery, yeah. uh, and, and the rules are in their favour. I mean, with per, with back to personal motivation. For me, I know that uh, a, a lot of people, particularly even just you, tried to get me into certain rhythms and setting goals. And it wasn't until I got older where I sort of came to the realization that I'm not going to do any of that unless it's my idea. Mm. For for whatever reason, that's the way my mind works. If I want to do something and it's not my idea. I'm going to struggle to do it. But mm. if, if I come up with the idea and I work out how I'm going to do it in my own mind and then I can have, have a, as you said, a clear-cut way, steps, all that type of stuff, then I can get it done. Well, there's that, there's that independence. So your mother and I succeeded. You're, you, <laughs> you've nailed you be, it. Well, you became independent and, and independent thought and you're working your own stuff out. And, and anybody who wants to go forward likes to and, and and that's that's it's actually a, a good point for for leadership you know don't try and smother mm. your subordinates and be everything for them just put them in an environment where what you're supporting them with will allow them to to dive into those it's like a flower things. you're surrounded with the right soil the right moisture the nice, right nice yeah, vitamins yeah. vitamins well It'll grow Malcolm really, you know, just back to footy, you talk about coaches. He was a coach who, um, he was a, uh, he probably wasn't the greatest technical coach, um, but it was, yeah, he was enthusiasm, he was aggression, he was belief, 
Um, he didn't see any barriers, you know, don't put barriers up. But what he did mostly, and, and we won competitions and, and uh, you know, we were one of the best football teams in the world at the, at the time under his coaching, um, not to forget, you know, the, the coaching and the preparation that had happened in the years earlier, because um, they were good coaches. But at this time, the team had just matured to a sort of a point. There was some you know, good mix of uh, older guys and, and, uh, and to have an overbearing coach who tried to micromanage every little part uh, wasn't the right call. And Mao was the perfect coach because that wasn't how he coached. An example of the first um, um, expression of that was uh, Mal flogged us through the, uh, the off season when he first came in 95, just doing a laps around the race course, 2.1 sprints. It's killing us like in the heat. We did that three nights a week and it was, um, it was tough stuff. And uh, Mao wasn't happy with us, you know, fucking shite. He's a Yorkshireman. And um, uh, anyway, we, we had a, a video of a game, a trial game, and we'd go up to the video room. And normally, w the video room would be a two hour video. We used to take in pillows because everyone had bad backs and everything or had to put their legs up and put ice on. And so we'd have pillows and you just lie there and the coaches would just go through chapter and verse and every little detail and you know you might write a few notes or you don't or, or you fall asleep sometime um, which wasn't uncommon but um, um, Mal's put it on put the video on and fed it within about three or four minutes he said well that's a fucking enough <laughs> okay and so he's looking at us and we're you know we're, we've all assumed the the relaxed positions and he says you're looking around well, come on, it's not my fucking team. Oh, now you normally tell us what's going on and, well, I don't know these blokes. <laughs> you know these blokes. He said, you're fucking better than these blokes and, and um, uh, you know, what can I tell you, Chief and Butts, about your position? You know, you know that better than I do. So he, he empowered us, basically handed the team over to us. Although he was completely in charge, and, and um, he was the iron will behind everything and you didn't want to get upset with him because he'd, he'd get you in the boxing ring and slap you around a little bit, legally. Um, but he just inspired everybody. Um, every time he'd, the time he swam in the pool uh, at the, um, the university and he, he turns up and we're all diving off the blocks, seeing how far we can swim underwater. Where's Mal? Oh, let's just keep diving under the water. And it's Neil Pincinelli, you've got a bit. 35 meters or something which is pretty good swim underwater and um he said oh that's that's pretty good uh, mal's turned up he said uh, so what are you fucking doing and they said oh, we're just saying who can swim the furthest yeah okay so what's, what's the furthest you're 35 meters that's fucking shite <laughs> we, what do you got old man and, and mal was one of those blokes who'd always turn up with a tie you know, very english you know this is and this was summer in, in australia but, Tired Julius Marlowe's pleats perfect on his strides. And um, he said, well, I don't have any swimmers. Matty Johns, <laughs> in a public pool, <laughs> drops his gear, throws the wet shorts up to Matt, up to uh, Malcolm. <laughs> so <laughs> Matty's now nude in this public pool, <laughs> which is funny. And um, so Mal's, Mal's said, well, okay. So he's gone, gone into the room, he's come out, with Matty's shorts on. And we said, oh, now listen, you can go up and dive off because, you know, you get a good run up. You know, you get to get a bit further. Oh, that's fucking cheating. <laughs> you know, typical Mal, like he was always just, nah. And um, so he started from the shallow end and he plonked himself in the shallow end. <clears throat> it was all about the mind for Mal, that you can do anything that if you, you put your mind to it. And that was the example he was setting to us. And, and so he starts from the shallow end and he's breathing and he gets focused and we're all just laughing and giving it, you're giving it to the old pommy and he, he's got this little bit of Devon sort of sitting on his head. Who's throwing Devon, you know, and all this and, and, and just gigging him. And, but he was just serious and off he went. <laughs> and he was super slow compared to what the boys were doing. Every, you know, big athletes, ripped through the water. So Mal, he went super slow. And he got to about 20 metres, like he'd, he'd been underwater 30 seconds or something. And I said, oh, mate, he's, he's not going to go much further now. And he kept going, he kept going. He got to the 40 metre. Uh, he got to 45 metres and the little Devon 
just broke the surface. And then he went down again. And then he touched the wall and he bounced up and the eyes were popping out of his head and the neck was like, a man was about 50 then. And, um, and blowing. And he, he told me later that he was quite crook after it because you end up with a lot of lactic sort of build up and because uh, it's all anaerobic, you've only got one breast. And, and mate, we were just floored that this old fellow could do that. Uh, and that, that, that was the power of belief he was trying to put into us. And, um, uh, and I think it takes time to, to, to learn that, like to, to absorb it um, so that it means something to you. A lot of people, yeah, I may believe, I believe, I believe. But do you really, do you, you know, viscerally believe in yourself uh, to the point where nobody can convince you that you're anything other? Um, and that's what you know you need in life to push through and to be resilient and get knocked over and fail and then get up and try again and fail better and, and get up and then finally get, get what you need. And uh, uh, for most kids, I don't see that resilience. You know, I see it's a lot, a lot of the schools that you went to, everybody gets a prize. Nobody gets upset and, and they want to just keep you in a certain <coughs> group. And, you know, and if somebody's got a bit more spirit, you know, they try and whip that spirit out of them. And uh, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's an easy job uh, looking after our kids at schools and things like that. But uh, I think we could do better in, in survival skills uh, things that are interesting to kids so they, they do understand themselves a little bit. You know, schools might say, well, that's not our purpose. You know, go and see a psychologist if you want to know about that stuff. But we know with the um, huge amount of um, challenges for young kids and, and uh, whether it's by coincidence, we're also seeing a huge amount of, of anxiety and depression and, you know, and, uh, then we've got all this technology. So we're in that... Some have referred to it as the quickening period. Everything's just speeding up and you've got no time to get off and it's just super fast and, and you don't know everything and you're not, you're not intended to know everything. And the only people that know everything are the people who, who um, track your, um, your movements and your, and your Facebooks and your parties and your... Parties? Par well, you have a party and, or you have, have lunch and you take a photo, look at me having lunch and all of these sorts of things. Um, you know, the privacy thing, we, we had that chat a while back, you, you and I, and I think you started to back off on a little bit of, you're putting everything out there. Uh, I don't know how you can be private now with what you do, but um, uh, I just think, you know, privacy was highly regarded mm. before. Um, I, I put it literally to 9-11. Before 9-11, like, privacy was all important. Nobody knew you you know your birth date and they didn't know what your dog's name was and um and then it became considered to be you know normal after 9 11 that you know laws were changed and and it was you know we need to know about everybody we need to follow everybody if you've got a beard you know we need to know what's under that beard what's in that beard what are you hiding there um and and and, and so it's just become considered normal share your entire life mm. Uh, now, is that, a, is that a good thing? Particularly, I'd, I'd say for some where people throw that back at people who aren't strong uh, personally or internally, emotionally, uh, that can have uh, big impacts. You know, we've, we've seen the, you know, that young lad who killed himself the other night after copying a, uh, a drilling on um, Facebook or whatever. The bloke from the Young Liberals, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, like that's, that's a tragedy. The video went viral on Twitter. Uh, a couple of million views about him uh, egging on some drag queens, perhaps, is a way to phrase yeah. it. And uh, he had a massive backlash uh, from uh, from the Twitterverse and on Facebook and YouTube and stuff. And mm. and people went after him and attacked him and told him to kill himself, and he did. So what does that say about us? You know, like like we all want to we want to just get in there and kick the shit out of this yeah, bloke. There's, and there's a big put removal. the slipper in anonymously because you're not there. You wouldn't say that if old mate was right there. You know, this is all this about. So this. why do we do it? What's it, like? It, it's become the norm. And other people are doing it. It's the diffusion of the responsibility sort of thing. Hmm. But you see all these other people, so you just go, ah, I'm going to join in. I'm going to have a go at him. Or do I'm going to say whatever I want because I'm anonymous. Or I've got my name there. It doesn't matter. Like you see with that with that young bloke, you saw people who have big public presence 
they have a blue tick on, on Twitter and they write for the Sydney Morning blue Herald tick. or they do oh, whatever. God. I've got a blue tick. Not on Twitter. Twitter. But these people who are very, you know, they're, they're maybe they're respected in the field, they're journalists, they're news providers, whatever, they're authors. And they went out and they said horrible things about this young person. And then he goes mm. and kills himself. And then the next day they change their tone. <laughs> it's just one of these things that, that it has become a part of the internet. And people will, I was talking about this with Kurt Fernley about he gets hate mail. And you think, why would this person get hate mail? This guy is trying to help people with disabilities. He's, a, he's an inspiration. He's crawled the Kokoda Trail, mm. an inspirational man. Mm. And even he gets hate mail. So that's just a comment on the, on the community that is the internet, that people are just vicious pieces of shit. So, you know, is it necessarily a good thing? Should we continue and invest our time in it? Uh, or should we encourage kids or should kids encourage their own peers to just back off from it a little bit and, 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 and walk away, uh, particularly from the, the sort of social media um, channels, which, which you know, that's, that's nothing more than being a bully. Yeah. So, okay, you might want to have a bit of a cracker, you know, you type something out, yeah, good on your dickhead or, or whatever. But once, once everybody gets into a frenzy, you know, we're back in the dark ages when people used to follow people through streets and yeah, chop through. his head off yeah. and chop the guy and oh, there goes the head, yeah, yeah. everyone's cheering. What are they cheering about? That was the same, yeah, actually, if you think of the, um, uh, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, Jesus ends up, um, getting uh, jeered by um, all of the followers and and um, nobody helped pick up his cross as he went up on Calvary and and he got uh, crucified and that was um, you know that was just by a mob yeah. of, of people um, the history records it as you know, the Jewish people of the area you know which is why the, the, the Jewish people cost a copper a bit of a raz uh, from time to time, probably unfairly, but um, but that was the crowd at the time, and they were they were all sort of reasonable people, I imagine. But um, this mob mentality to get in and kick the shit out of your fellow man, um, I think, is you know, is one of the real bad things of society at mm. the moment. And uh, a lot of our kids and a lot of our little kids are seeing that as normal stuff. Um, some are affected and uh, you know, affects them deeply, and particularly as you're trying to establish yourself in amongst a little group. You know, when you're when you're young and that, you know, a bit of social connection, a bit of respect by these guys or the cool guys or the whatever guys, and you know, you, you need that. And and kids internalise that quite deeply. Uh, and if they if they're shunned or they're made a gig of or uh, or whatnot, uh, and worse, if 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 they do it in front of everybody. Uh, and everybody's reading that, and the next day, like you just don't want to go to school mm. because every kid at school saw that post, and so your life is, is over as you know it. Yeah, that's, that's um, that can have a massive impact on kids, mm. and um, you know it goes on. Um, what are we going to do about it? This, this is a matter for your generation. Exactly. You know, to, to change your your posture a little bit, and say, well, you know. Well, when this social media first came on, like let's say 50 years time, somebody's writing a book. You know, when it first came on, everyone just attacked each other and we were all, we were all bastards. And, um, um, but we started to work out how really to use it so that it, it benefited people and, and um, supported people. And I don't know how that can happen though. I, I can't see people like controlling themselves. It is the cancel culture that we have now. It's this thing of people walking through the streets throwing, you know, rotten tomatoes at them. People love that. They see someone do something that they see is wrong uh, and people just attack. They smell blood in the water and they go for it. And that's mm. because you'll see, you'll see in this video when we put this up, people will really like it and then there'll be people that hate it and they feel as if, the people, particularly the people that hate it, they feel as if they need to tell me, they need to tell you, they need to tell everyone in the comment section that they didn't agree with this point or they didn't like this point. And it's like, mate, who cares? Get on with it. You know, I've never commented on one of these videos, no. like like a point of view. You might say, great video, whatever, awesome. You know, why would you watch something and, and have the shits with it? Why wouldn't you just enjoy yourself and then move on with it? Yeah, well, it's you know, it's it's good to have that debate. You know, I, you know, I enjoyed this, but it didn't quite. So a bit of feedback, you know, um, and I guess part of the whole 
shtick is to um, engage your audience. Mm. And one measure of engagement is that they've responded. That's uh, great. And there are a lot of great people that respond. Yeah. I don't want to dull that down for a moment. Like, there are a lot of great people that get on, particularly this channel. It's always very positive. There are very few negative yeah. comments, but they exist. Yeah, well. They're well, very, 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 f- most people are happy people, but there are negative people around. Oh, mate, there's, there's plenty of disaffected people out there, you know, in, in the world that we live. Um, you know, the, the financial challenges people are facing, the um, you know, anemic uh, wages growth, the, the, the insecurity in the workplace and casualisation with the separation of families and uh, the price of living and uh, the lack of support from government. Uh, like there are some people out there in a pretty prick of a position, mm. you know, and they could be any any handle on on YouTube, and, and they're carrying all sorts of baggage. Um, you know, perhaps it's a reflection of just how poorly we are managing our society, or the governments are, or ourselves, is that we have so many dickheads or or disaffected people uh, who are contributing. Uh, would you looking 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 at it the another way? If we had a society where you know, people were happy and content and supported and um, everyone got sort of looked after, was a reasonable standard of living, would you have so many dickheads? Would that reduce? You know, so there's, there's, there's lots of factors that go into this. Um, and, you know, I, I spoke earlier about my history. My history goes back 50 years, you know. But there's a lot of people that go back 20, 30, 40 years and have had very difficult childhoods, um, some are just some childhoods are just you know just you know, unspeakable, you know, and, and they were there for for that that period of time, and and they're still sitting out there, and they may be responding or watching mm. this this video, and um, and their life was turned upside down. So how do they then sort of turn everything around? They have, you've got to be positive, you've got to be enthusiastic, you've got to believe in yourself, and that's that self motivation, and recognizing that there is a world of abundance. Okay, I ran into brick walls over here and I was dealt some really bad cards, parents or no parents or um, or whatever, but I still see a way out. I still see, I still believe in the, in the, in the, uh, the power of um, uh, positive thinking and moving forward and in life and achieving what you can while you're here, you're only here a short time. Anyway, on the topic of the internet, this is going out to millions of people. Oh my God. I know. Crazy, right? <laughs> we'll wrap it up, but I want to know do you have an Instagram you want to plug? Because I reckon you should have an Instagram. No. What do you mean? No, I, I value my privacy, my family's privacy. Well, you just put up selfies, photos of yourself. Why? There's heaps on the internet. Yeah, of you. Yeah. Yeah, if it, you want to update people, what if you get a new haircut? What if you've trimmed your nose hairs? What about all these things? Mate, my, my interest is my family. You could have the internet, the, the Instagram handle, the butts dad. <laughs> I, I could, I could. Well, mate, you, you, you raised something there I'll, I'll have to consider. I'm but going to start uh, you on Instagram. We'll see how many followers you can get. In, in answer to your question, no, I, I, <laughs> I have no, no desire to, to, to be out there in that way. But my life is full. Uh, with my beautiful babies. Make all, sure you all, follow the butt stat on Instagram. <laughs> the there's, premiere. There's no you... butt stat. <laughs> no. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Pa. I appreciate you coming yeah, in. Yeah, mate, it's just a nice little chat. You know, we probably... should do it again because we've got so many more things we could talk about. But it is Saturday, so let's yeah, get that's... on with our lives. Good on your brother. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it, ladies and gentlemen. What a great episode! Holy dooly! Make sure you subscribe. Check us out on iTunes and Spotify as well. And don't forget to uh, give us a little rating there. That's always very nice, isn't it? Yes, very nice. In Melbourne in a couple of weeks. Make sure you check out my comedy uh, tour. It's not a tour, is it, Connor? Festival. Festival. Yeah. Check me out in Melbourne. A brand new show. Absolutely pumped for that. So uh, make sure you head down there if you or if you're in Melbourne. Just head outside. Come along to the show. It's going to be great. Um, what else? Anything? That's a Clips Channel, ladies and gentlemen, the Butterfield Effect Clips Channel is if you want to digest this big meal that we've just had there in tiny little clips, just little snacks, you can go over to that and, and, and do that. Kind of, kind of puts all great clips up there. So ladies and gentlemen, be a good motherfucker. Peace to the Middle East, be dick stinks. And I'll see you all very soon. Toodaloo. Bye.